Welcome back to the EOS Phoenix channel with your host, Urias. I want to do a quick shout out to all the EOS family. You guys know who you are. This video is going to be pretty quick. I want to go over two topics I thought would be of interest to others. One is this term rehypothecation, and another is a movement within the crypto community uh, that's being termed proof of keys. Uh, this has started in different communities at different times, BitShares, Bitcoin, etc. But now there's an effort to, I think, unite these and have an annual event where all users take ownership of their digital assets off the exchanges. So I'm going to try to tie the concept of rehypothecation with this movement and explain why it's important for anybody who holds uh, digital tokens to be aware of this and consider... Uh, participating if you don't already hold your, your keys on your, your cold storage wallets. So let's go back to basics before we get into that. A theoretical example of all the roles here. This is a very simplified one that is being shown on the screen. So on the left we have a seller with a good with goods. We have an exchange and we have a buyer with uh, currency or maybe another good. And so this isn't really an example that is specific to crypto as you can see but I just kind of want to go over the roles so everybody's aware of how this is all playing out. So the seller obviously has a good or um, service to offer, and in traditional markets, this could be really anything, food, oil, water, electricity, etc. In the crypto world, the seller uh, would have a digital asset, and that digital asset, uh, it being a token, would have maybe unique properties or features that enable somebody who holds that coin the ability to perform different functions on that platform. Now, the role of the exchange in this case would be to link the seller with the buyer. And the buyer being somebody with you know, US dollars or maybe another digital asset in which they want to trade with the seller. So this is a very simplified exchange example. And it would probably be more characterized as a peer-to-peer -peer example where the exchange is linking a seller with a buyer. Um, and so this is maybe the way you'd see something like a decentralized exchange or a DEX operate, but we also know that there's the largest exchanges up to this point are centralized in nature, such as Coinbase and others, Poloniex, etc. So now let's look at actually um, the more of the theoretical example in an exchange of an asset. The exchange in this case normally <clears throat> at some point in time would hold actually both assets for the buyer and seller, sometimes on a long-term basis. So a person with uh, goods in terms even of a digital asset like Bitcoin or EOS, they'd actually have some type of a wallet on the exchange. And the person with fiat or other digital goods would have his or her wallet. So we say person A and person B. Um, exchange, you know, technically would be limited to selling person A's assets to a buyer, um, you know, if consented by that person. So this is, again, in theory how it would work. And they would also be limited in terms of how many coins they can actually put on their trading books, right? Because they only hold so many coins in their exchange. Now, Fair Exchange, you know, ideally would store each person's coins in their own wallet. So in this visual example, you can see the coins stored in person A's wallet. Now, in practice, you know, this would allow... Uh, anybody really to audit uh, that firm's uh, holdings and ensure that for every person who uh, is supposed to have their coins on the exchange, there is a matched amount of coins within the person's wallet within the exchange. So right now though, as you guys know, a lot of this stuff is in the gray area. So there's no formal way that most of these exchanges are audited and so this brings me to my next slide of what actually happens in the exchange of an asset. And I mean, there are examples of DEXs, like I said, where you can actually track the movement of coins. But for all practical purposes, what we're talking about here is centralized exchanges. So in these cases, some of these exchanges actually hold what could be characterized as pools. Um, pools, what I mean by that is just groups of coins in, a, in one wallet. So everybody's coins in one wallet and these are uh, mainly grouped by common digital assets. And in fact, some may be even operating what we call a reserve amount of tokens. 
So in theory, if we go back to um, the example I just shared in the slide before, you know, for every coin, for every person that has a coin on the exchange, it's uh, basically a match. So any claim that a person has on the number of coins, that exchange would have that number in their in their actual exchange. In this case, with a reserve type of uh, operation, they may have less coins in the in the actual wallets than the people than they're actually saying they have to people who use their services. And so this is point number two. Now users wouldn't really know this and you might wonder, well, how are they able to get away with this? Well, the main takeaway here is that many users today hold most of their digital assets on those exchanges. So there's not a huge amount of, of movement and even within trading on the exchange, if you think about it in theory, those assets are just trading between users on that exchange. They're not leaving the exchange. So if you were to do a, a, a mathematical formula and determine the the actual flow away from an exchange, it would be less than a hundred percent of you know the, the the activity on that exchange. So in theory, again, many of these exchanges could be operating on a reserve basis and users would have no way of knowing that unless they request ownership of the token back from the exchanges into their personal cold storage wallets. And so that, this, what I just explained here about um, basically these exchanges potentially holding pool, you know, holding pools of common digital assets and essentially having less than what they're supposed to for all their users is, is sort of a form of rehypothecation because what they're doing is they're taking the assets that they have for one person and they're reusing it for other purposes, whether that's to claim that they have tokens for other users on their exchange, or potentially another application they may be using these for is to take the assets they have in their pooled wallets and use it as collateral to um, perform some market pricing functions, which could distort prices. And so that's really what rehypothecation is. Um, in traditional markets, typically what they would do is actually uh, compensate the users even for, for, for maybe doing that. But it's something that we really don't want to see in any markets because it leads to, again, the distortion of the price discovery of those assets. So a traditional term of rehypothecation, I, I have it here. It's the practice of assets used and reused in such a way the credit multiples far outweigh the actual assets in the accounts, in this case, the wallet of the exchange. In effect, rehypothecated assets become part of a daisy chain, for lack of a better term, wherein one company's liabilities becomes another's assets. So in this uh, very simplified example, and you could take any coin, an exchange say has 10 Bitcoins, which I know is a very small amount, but it, the, the numbers don't matter. What is important is for you guys to understand the concept and use your wallets. And uh, the user is given the consent for selling, but they indicate on their user interface, maybe when you log in, that they have 20 Bitcoin on their trading books um, for the sale. And they basically have reused these assets on a factor of two to one. Now, you might wonder then, well, Urias or, or EOS Phoenix, you know, how can they get away with this? Well, let's go back to what I just described earlier in this uh, broadcast. Most crypto users still hold a good majority of their assets on central exchanges that hold crypto and pools not audited. It is a gray area for regulation. And moreover, most of the hodlers don't even move their tokens. So it's not too far-fetched to believe that, you know, they many of these could actually be operating on a reserve basis. Users who buy and sell assets do not always take delivery into their own cold wallets. This means an exchange can simply claim a transfer of a coin was performed within their platform without an actual transfer occurring. So they can just basically flip digits, you know, type in whatever they want. If you bought or traded on their exchange 20 Bitcoin or 100 Bitcoin or whatever it is, they can simply put that in the interface and claim that there's 100 Bitcoin there, but they actually haven't transferred anything to your account. Um, so that's a huge risk. Now, the way they've gotten away with this in the past and the way I've seen it, and I'll, and I'll call people out here, you know, and and, and for those that are crypto OGs, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
you know, if you guys remember in the run-up, in the previous run-up, in 20, 2015, 2016 timeframes, 2017 even timeframes, you had issues even with the likes of folks like Polo. And, uh, you know, I won't name anybody here, but let's just say uh, some OGs who frequent this, uh, you know, uh, community here are have direct experience with delays as much as six months to eight months with a hundred thousand dollars in 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 assets okay and so uh, really what you're seeing what you see is these exchanges often add delays in their delivery for digital assets when they get in a bind and that um, basically buys them time to secure the coins and usually what they're actually waiting for is a huge decline in prices so that they can buy the coins back. Again, it's all uh, a bunch of manipulation in some ways. So um, you might wonder, so what's the risk for the crypto community? What's the risk for EOS? What's the risk for Bitcoin? One is obviously distortion of prices, which isn't good. They can basically move the markets the way they want because they have... Uh, borrowed basically your assets you've store you've decided to store on their exchanges for free and they say they do that on a risk-free basis they may also um, decide to you know leverage those and also known as rehypothecate so they use not only use your assets risk-free they basically borrow them on a risk-free basis but they could also rehypothecate them and borrow them on several different uh, functions, right? And so that could lead to huge risk in the markets, especially if there's a dislocation or something happens where they get caught on the wrong side of whatever trade they, they are doing. Also, the loss of coins, uh, the loss of coins, as coins traded on the exchange cannot be verified through public audit. So if you leave your coins on the exchange and you haven't actually claimed them, there's no way to know that what they're claiming on their account interface to you is actually the truth. You would only know that if you actually held those keys, held the tokens, and held your own private keys on your wallet. Now, the impact on platform operations uh, such as EOS could be felt because there could be uh, delays in the withdrawals themselves, which could prevent people from actually getting the functionality they need for an application. So what do we do about it? Bottom line is, hold your own private keys on your own hardware, on your own, I shouldn't say old, own hardware wallet. And the way you do this, you request a withdrawal from the exchange. This is a call on the exchange to, show, to ensure those entities play closer to being honest. It doesn't mean that they're gonna be completely honest, but this is one way, one move by the community to start this process and the idea is that every year January 3rd the first one being this upcoming year in 2019 uh, a movement across all crypto communities for users to hold their own keys to maintain fair price discovery and supply demand for platforms and uh, moving away from that or moving um, I guess evolving this you know wh what we want to do is actually um, be able to maintain a majority of the tokens off the exchange just because of this issue and the risk that it could bring. And let's all remember what the, you know, one of the main uh, points of crypto and blockchain is about. And it's about having your own keys, having your own ownership, you know, having your own money. If we're going to revert back to having centralized exchanges basically have assets under their control, I think we've kind of missed the point. So this is a quick video. I want to get this out. I'd love to hear your comments. Again, um, the idea here is January 3rd, the first one being this upcoming year for all crypto users to withdraw all the digital assets from the exchanges. Now, there is a risk that if you, you know, if there is an issue, um, like we've had with Mt. Gox, or I've had like with Polo in the past, even though a lot of people think Polo's great now, I, I, I'm one of the OGs that have had issues with it. If you decide to keep your, your coins on there and there is a problem, you risk a Mt. Gox event. So this is, uh, you know, fair warning to everybody to, to make sure you, um, you have some time to get practice with getting your coins off the exchanges and uh, making sure that they're playing honest. 
and not getting caught in in, in a polo event or a gox event because that was the, that's the last thing we want to see but uh, we do want to make sure they're playing by the rules so I'd love to hear your comments guys I uh, please hit the like button if you enjoy this content if you've learned something new I will include some links to uh, some additional articles on the term rehypothecation and look out for more content uh, educating the community on different things uh, to just be aware of. So this is uh, EOS Phoenix signing off. I want to give a shout out before I go to the Crypto Type, Crypto Fees, EOS Apologist, Cypher Glass, uh, Everything EOS, um, Dap Stars, and anybody else I'm forgetting. So uh, thank you so much, guys, and uh, yeah, we'll see you. Uh, see you later. Thanks. Bye.